Good evening, brothers and sisters. Tonight, we will be discussing Revelation chapter 11. This chapter introduces two prophets referred to as the two witnesses. Their message, supernatural power, death and resurrection, are significant moments in the story of the end times. Their influence comes after the end of the trumpet judgments and prepares us for the next chapters, which are about the seven bowl judgments. May you reflect on the symbolisms in this passage and may we be able to understand the truth presented to us. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us this time to learn more of your word. Lord, we pray that as we go through the books of Revelation, may you instill peace and confidence in our hearts that if we are in you, we need not fear whatever is to come. May you speak to each one of us tonight, and may our fellowship with one another be fruitful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our memory verse in Revelation 11 is verse 15. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Do you like to watch superhero stories? I do. DC, Marvel, these are some of our favorites. And we like our superhero characters to be invincible, powerful, and strong. There are even those characters who, seemingly dead, would appear alive again in succeeding movies. Tonight, as we study Revelation 11, we will meet two such characters. But the difference is, this is not fiction. This is for real, going to happen in the future. A big portion of Revelation 11 talks about two such characters. Of course, they're not Batman or Robin. They are simply called the two witnesses, and their enemy is the beast from the abyss, and their mission is to prophesy and evangelize during the Great Tribulation. We will see the full story tonight. Revelation 11 is divided into three main sections. The first section, verses 1 and 2, talks about the measuring of the temple of God. The second section, which is the longest one, is devoted to the story of the two witnesses. And the third section, verses 14 to 19, tells us about the blowing of the seventh trumpet. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for your word. We not only know how history began, but we know how everything is going to end. And we rejoice that the Lord Jesus is coming to judge and to reign. Lord, give us wisdom as we study this chapter, that we may know how we ought to live as children of the coming King. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So where is Revelation 11? Let us have a short review. Chapter 11 is in the middle of the book of Revelation, which has 22 chapters. The first three chapters were letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Chapters 4 and 5 gave us a vision of heaven, getting ready to for the breaking of the judgment on earth. In chapter 6, as Christ broke the seven seals one at a time, each seal reveals a future judgment. We know that there are seven seals, and then out of the seventh seal comes the seven trumpets. Chapter 9 described the fifth and sixth trumpets, also known as the first and second woes. Chapters 10 and the first part of chapter 11 gives us an interlude. There is a pause, a respite, before the blowing of the seventh trumpet. The purpose of each interlude is to comfort and give encouragement to the saints, particularly to those who will be alive during the time of the Great Tribulation. Imagine if I were to experience all the judgments described in chapters 5, 6, 8, and 9, I would be searching the scriptures for some explanation, and I would find the interludes to be very encouraging and comforting, because I would be reminded that God is still in control, that have, everything is happening according to his plan, and that there is going to be a glorious ending for Christ and the church. Now we come to chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshippers, but exclude the altar court, 
do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Remember in chapter 10, John was told to eat the little scroll. Now here in chapter 11, verse 1, he is told by someone to take a rod and measure the temple of God. According to Pastor John MacArthur, this someone is likely an angelic being. John was told to take a measuring rod like a staff. The word is kalamos. It's um, the name of a reed, which is between 15, 10 to 15 feet high, like a bamboo stalk, and it is used as a measuring instrument. John was asked to rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Why? What for? In the Bible, the idea of measuring communicates ownership, protection, and preservation. For example, in Revelation 21, verse 15, it speaks of measuring the new Jerusalem, the holy city. When Habakkuk prophesied, he also stood and measured the earth. Today, it is common practice in the purchase of land to hire the services of a surveyor, the purpose of which is to define and to mark the parameters of uh, or boundaries of a property. In the same thought, God is measuring out the temple, defining its parameters, defining his property, what it is that belongs to him, or better, who it is that belongs to him. God is saying, I am going to measure out the people who worship me the temple, Israel, because they are mine. I will protect them. I will preserve them and show favor to them. So in doing that, he is identifying it as his own because he has plans for it. According to Pastor John MacArthur, the temple refers to the holy place and the holy of holies. The brazen altar would be the outer area where the people worship, pray, and offer their sacrifices. This instruction to John to measure the temple implies that there is going to be a temple during the time of tribulation, because how can they be worshiping in a temple if there is none? We know there is no temple now. That is why Bible, uh, Bible scholars believe that there will be a rebuilding of the temple during the time of tribulation. And when that temple is set up, then the Jews will begin to worship there. This is also the temple that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 describes that the Antichrist will desecrate and display himself as being God. Now, verse 2 says, Leave out the outer the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it. Now, this image shows the layout of the temple. It had in the inner heart, the Holy of Holies. And then outside of that, the holy place. And outside of that, the courtyard of the brazen altar where sacrifice was made. And outside of that was called the court, the outer court or the court of the Gentiles. John was instructed, don't measure the court, referring to the outer court or the court of the Gentiles, for it has been given to the nations. According to Matthew Henry, those who worship in the outer court either worship in a false manner or with hypocritical hearts, and these are rejected by God. Therefore, God did not include them in the measurement to be marked for preservation. Verse 2 also says the Gentiles are going to trample or attack Jerusalem for 42 months. This is equivalent to three and a half years or 1260 days. So the second three and a half years of the tribulation period, coinciding with the reign of the Antichrist, the Gentiles will desecrate and destroy the city of Jerusalem until the return of Jesus Christ. In these two simple verses, God is measuring out the temple because it belongs to him. The Jews are God's possession, and God will keep his promise and bring Israel to salvation and to the kingdom. And he says, don't measure the outside, referring to the Gentiles, because Gentile nations will trample the city of Jerusalem, but God will limit it to 42 months, which is the last half of the seven years called the Great Tribulation. 
Now, the second section of this chapter starts in verse 3 and runs down to verse 13. We will look now at two very interesting preachers who will appear to proclaim salvation, to call men to repentance, as well as to warn about judgment. The invincible duo is called the two witnesses. Verse 3, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouths and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Verse 7, And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the, prof, uh, from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents, because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of, the, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. In the midst of Gentiles trampling on the holy city, the world will see these two amazing preachers. Until the very end, God keeps the door of grace open by preaching the gospel, giving people opportunity to hear the gospel. In verse 3, a speaker says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses. Because of the personal pronoun I, the speaker would have to be one of either two persons, God the Father or the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why two witnesses? In the Old Testament, any time a testimony was given, it needs to be confirmed by at least two witnesses. So here are two witnesses given authority to give testimony to God. It says, and they will prophesy. The word prophesy here does not have the primary sense of predicting the future, but rather of standing before the world and they will preach judgment, the coming wrath of God. They will be calling men and women to repentance and salvation. And they will do this for 1260 days or three and a half years. They are clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth is a primitive garment. It is rough, it is coarse and heavy. It was used in ancient times uniquely by the prophets whenever they were prophesying judgment. It was expressive of sadness, of humility, of mourning over the wickedness of the world and the judgment of God falling upon them. Now verse four gives us a very unusual description. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now the imagery here parallels Zechariah's uh, prophecy, chapters three and four, where two olive trees and two lampstands represent how God raised up Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the ruler. These two men were instruments that God sent and used in the ancient Israel with the power of the Holy Spirit to rebuild and revive Israel after their captivity. Similarly, here in Revelation 11, it uses the same imagery. There will be, in the end times, two witnesses through whom God will flow in Holy Spirit power to bring about renewal, salvation, and restoration of Israel and the bringing in of the glorious kingdom. God used Joshua and Zerubbabel in the ancient Israel. He will use these two witnesses during the tribulation. Some preachers like Pastor John MacArthur believe that it is during the tribulation that Israel will be saved. 
there will be a great movement that will cause Israel's response to the gospel. Now, verse 5 and 6 tells us more about the powers of these two witnesses. Now, the question is, who are they? We don't know. Some believe that they could be Moses and Elijah because of the things that they do, fire, drought, water, turning to blood, and smiting the earth with plague, are very similar to what Moses and Elijah did. Elijah brought down fire from heaven and so, so that it consumed the enemies of God. He also shut off rain from heaven, and Moses turned water into blood and smote the people of Egypt with all kinds of plagues. But one thing is for sure, these two witnesses will certainly be very powerful servants of God. Everybody who tries to get rid of them will be instantly consumed by fire coming out of their mouths. They can potentially shut the sky so that there's going to be no water to drink, no water to feed the animals or water the plants. And there will be plague everywhere. They are invincible, unstoppable, until their allotted time is up. Verse 7 says, their allotted time is up when they have finished their testimony. Then their work is done. Revelation 9-11 talked about the angel of the abyss. Here in Revelation 11 is the first mention of the beast. Again, Pastor John MacArthur explains that this beast is none other than the Antichrist. He comes up out of the pit. He is a man. He is human. But he is empowered by the pit or the abyss. He is an instrument of Satan. And the Antichrist is victorious over these two preachers. Verse 8 says, Their dead bodies will lie on the streets of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. What is called the great city here is referring to Jerusalem. Sadly, Jerusalem is also described as Sodom and Egypt. Sodom represents wickedness and Egypt, idolatry and tyranny. How sad that these two witnesses are killed in the city of God's people, where also their Lord was crucified. Verse 9 describes how the whole world will look at their dead bodies. Probably videos of their dead bodies will be circulated in social media and all over the internet, and they will be refused burial. Their bodies will be left in the street to decay. Three days is enough for the bodies to decay. They will be treated in humiliation and hatred and dishonor. The world will give the Antichrist glory because he was able to kill these two whom no one else could kill. People, you know, usually uh, exchange gifts during Christmas parties and other celebrations, right? But here everyone is rejoicing and partying and exchanging gifts after these two witnesses died. Verse 10 says, Because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth, the world could not stand them confronting their sins because they feel tormented by their warnings. They refuse to believe the gospel. The party did not last very long. After the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stand, they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were beholding them. They heard a voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up into heaven into the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Can you imagine this awesome scene? It's a two-man rapture. Verse 13, and in that hour there was a great earthquake, not just an earthquake, but a great one. And a tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed in that earthquake. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. What does that mean? Pastor John MacArthur believes this points to true repentance and true faith for Israel, citing different references in the Bible that connects giving glory to God and the fear of God as a saving response. Finally, the remaining remnant of Israel is described as believing. The interlude ends. The third section of this chapter begins with verse 14. This is the third woe, the seventh and last trumpet. Verse 14. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord 
and of our Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for awarding, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightnings, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Here we have the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and we are, we are looking at the result from heaven's perspective. What happened at heaven's side? There was loud and joyful acclamation of the saints and angels in heaven. They thankfully recognized the right of our God and Savior to rule and reign over all the world. At this point, Jesus Christ is not yet completely reigning as king. The final victory will be at Armageddon. But here it is spoken of as if the sovereign kingdom is as good as done. They also rejoice that his reign shall be forever and ever. Even the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worship God and gave thanks to him. There are different views on who the 24 elders are, but according to Pastor John MacArthur, they are best understood to be representatives of the glorified church as the redeemed and raptured church. Verse 18 tells us that the nations were enraged with God because the world does not want the reign of God. They were hostile against God and God responds with wrath. It is a time for God to take a just revenge upon the enemies of his people. It is also a time to reward the people's faithful services and sufferings, and those who destroy the earth will themselves be destroyed. Finally, we come to the last verse. The imagery is of temple of God in heaven being opened. The Ark of Covenant is there. The temple of God speaks of his presence, his throne, the place where he dwells. During the reign of the Antichrist, it seems that the law of God is set aside. This beautiful imagery is a picture of the presence of God returned to his people, as if saying the arms of God are open to take into his presence all of his people. The covenant speaks of God's promise to have eternal communion with the redeemed. The ark is the symbol of God's faithfulness, Two, bestowing grace on his people, the lightnings, voices, thunderings, or earthquakes, and great hail are God's answer and response to the prayers offered by his people and God's vengeance on his people's enemies. In closing, we remember what Peter said, in the light of all these things, what manner of people ought we to be? And as Paul put it, Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. If the world is headed towards this inevitable holocaust of furious judgment, and we know it, how responsible are we to preach the gospel? We who belong to Christ have the wonderful privilege of knowing his word, and along with it comes immense responsibility. May the Holy Spirit Make us be faithful ambassadors of Christ. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. May you allow your truth to affect our lives, affect how we deal with other people, affect what we do with our time, the choices that we make. Father God, help us to live and spend our time and our efforts in things that matter to your church and your kingdom. Help us to live lives that honor you as king. In Christ's most precious name we pray, amen. Thank you, dear brothers and sisters, and we, we all have a Good evening, brothers and sisters. We have reached the first half of our study of the book of Revelations. Next Friday night for chapter 12, Brother Jonathan will discuss about the invisible war. We invite you to our breaking of bread this Lord's Day at 10 a.m. Don't miss it. 
Do you know the Word of God commands us to remember as well as to forget? When and where did the Lord say to forget it? Join us in our worship service this Lord's Day and let us learn together as Pastor David Goh shares from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. See you all. Good night and God bless.